Welcome to another season of Hoda's Career Info, the program where career professionals from across the globe meet to empower you to succeed. This program is brought to you by Right Career Fit. Listen and learn, and remember to have that very important career conversation with a career professional. Always understand that there's very, very different paths to be able to get to the future that you want. Don't worry about the thing that, that like there's one thing and it's going to be for an entire career. Worry about the next thing. It's really important to have a thesis about what you feel motivates you the most. Every time in history is challenging. This is an especially challenging time. Thank you for joining me in Hodes Career Info, your career program where guests from across the globe share career tips and personal stories to help you successfully navigate your career. I am Hoda, your host. I look forward to another season of career chats with international professionals who will inspire you to take your journey to the next level. My guest today on Hoda's Career Info is Gary Bowles. Gary Bowles is the author of The Next Rules of Work, The Mindset, Skill Set, and Tool Set to lead your organization through uncertainty. In short, it is your guide to the brave new world of work for the post-pandemic era. Gary has over 1.3 million learners on LinkedIn Learning with courses such as Learning Mindset, Learning Agility, Leading Change, and his brand new course, Skills for Leading the Future of Work. As an adjunct chair for the future of work for Singularity University, Gary helps people understand the impact on opportunities of exponential change for individuals, organizations, communities, and countries. As partner in the consulting agency Charret LLC, Initiatives with Impact, Gary helps organizations, communities, educators, and governments develop strategies for what's next. As co-founder of eParachute.com, Gary helps job hunters and career changers with programs inspired by the book, What Color Is Your Parachute? The World's Enduring Career Manual. Bowles is a former Silicon Valley executive, a serial entrepreneur, and the former editorial director for six technology publications. He is also a co-founder of SoCap, the world's largest gathering of impact entrepreneurs and investors, as well as a number of other catalytic events. Learn more about Gary at gballs.com. You can also find Gary on social media everywhere, including LinkedIn, Twitter, and Medium. All you have to do is look for G-B-O-L-L-E-S. Join us as Gary shares rich advice to young job seekers, as well as his inspiring and positive take on the latest technological innovations. Thank you so much, Gary Bowles, for joining me today on Hoda's Career Info. It's a pleasure to have you. And I'm very excited by the conversation I know we're going to have uh, listening to your expertise and learning from your experience. I will start with my first question that I ask all guests. Can you choose one term that defines your career so far and define it from your perspective? Okay. <laughs> so um, I, I guess the, 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 red thread for me, like that, that sort of carries through with all the things that I've done uh, in my work uh, and my learning, because I, I don't separate those two, 
uh, is unrelenting curiosity. Um, I, I find that the, the, my North Star, the thing that, that keeps on pulling me, is that I'm just endlessly fascinated by such a range of different uh, issues, people, um, uh, countries, organizations. Uh, and so that continues to pull me in the what I call my portfolio of work in the range of different activities that I do. It's such an important thing to be doing for all of us to be curious in the, what we do and uh, uh, what we hope to accomplish in our life. My next question to you, Gary, is um, can you tell us a little bit about your story, how you got to where you got today, and perhaps if you don't want to do it, the whole story, a portion of it, but within it, a message that you'd like to share by being here today on this program. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I uh, would hope that any impression that I have followed a very clear and direct path would be immediately evaporated <laughs> by, by showing that that I've sort of gone through what I think of as about five phases in my life, uh, not in any way because of planning, but because of a combination of the things that have fascinated me and the kinds of opportunities that uh, have either appeared or that I've been able to create for myself. So uh, I, give, I, I want to give first off anybody listening the, the license to always understand that there's very, very different paths to be able to get to the future that you want. My initial phase was completely rudderless. I did a, I never was very interested in college. I don't have enough college to stuff into a thimble. I did a series of odd jobs. Uh, it just so happens one of the odd jobs was the family business. And my father was a recovering minister who wrote a book called What Color Is Your Parachute, which became the world's enduring career manual. So I was actually trained as a career counselor when I was 19. So I, I understood a lot of the things about how humans make decisions about careers. I then had a phase as a uh, technology executive in Silicon Valley. I've worn about every hat that you can wear, um, including doing several startups. I had a phase where I started and uh, helped to run technology magazines because I was always fascinated about how the world, especially technology, was changing. That morphed into producing and um, delivering events with impact, starting gatherings for people, strategic ways that people could come together to be able to solve thorny problems on the future of education, the future of work, the growing gap between haves and have nots, uh, the need for social entrepreneurs. And then finally, in this phase, uh, I've, I've shifted to from being the person at the back end producing stuff to being the one at the front end on stage, writing and lecturing future of work, future of learning, and the future of the organization. And uh, so I, I think of these as a, a res the result of a, uh, an advanced case of adult attention deficit. <laughs> because things fascinate me so much, I want to do that thing and then that thing. And then uh, I'm able to knit them together into a portfolio of work and learning that, uh, that always keeps me satisfied. And such a beautiful journey. It definitely encourages and uh, ex exemplifies the career exploration that I tell the young people I work with that it's okay to go through that initial stage of exploring until you find one or many things that interest you. I'm sorry to interrupt you. So, so I absolutely agree with you. What, what I try to tell young people is don't worry about the thing that, that like there's one thing and it's going to be for an entire career. Worry about the next thing, like focus on the next thing. Don't, don't try to make decisions for a future version of you 30 or 40 years down the line, except for maybe saving for retirement. But don't try to make decisions for that person because you can't possibly know what that person's priorities are going to be. Focus on what the near future version of you wants to do the most right now. With all your expertise, I had to kind of scramble to and narrow down to a few questions, but I would have a lot more than time would allow us. But one thing I would like to talk about is your LinkedIn learning courses and skills for leading the future of work. With yeah. your expertise and with that course in mind, what can you tell the audience about the skills necessary for the future of work? Uh, I'm 
been had the benefit of uh, starting to work with um, LinkedIn Learning when it was uh, called Lynda.com years ago, and ended up doing a series of courses that I felt sort of hit different facets of the diamond about how we as, as uh, humans in the context of work and in the context of organizations, how we keep on trying to navigate change. And so the early ones were a learning mindset, learning agility, um, leading change, you know, very sort of basic, you know, uh, insights about how each of us as humans can continually grow and change. And then I realized, though, with so much of the ways that work is changing, that uh, it's really important to have a thesis about what is the most important as, as so many of the different facets of work of cha are changing. First, we had this global pandemic, what I called the Great Reset. Then this, uh, what I call the, the artificial intelligence uh, quiet tsunami, this wave of new tools that is washing through work. But we need some really sort of solid anchors as we think about the, the highest priorities for humans um, in, in the way that work is changing. And so I grouped the, the skills, the, the areas of focus for each of us into four different areas. And what I'd say is, I, I think that if you're going to lead, if you're whether you're leading a team or you're leading an organization or you know something in between, we have to focus on four things. First is growth. Uh, that is that there are organizations that are doubling down on helping every single human being to have a growth mindset, as Carol Dweck talks about in her book, Mindset. The second is effectiveness, is how each of us can have a set of goals of agreements about the things we need to accomplish in our work and then the actual activities that we perform. And we want that Venn diagram to be as close as possible. So effectiveness is about continually trying to do the best that you can in the context of work for the agreements of what it is the value that you're, you're creating is. The third is membership. Uh, we often use phrase, words like uh, diversity, uh, inclusion, um, uh, justice and so on, I, I sort of put those into an arena of membership, which is essentially our degree of connection to the work that we do. And the final one is uh, synchrony or alignment. Um, and so it just so happens this spells gems, I call it the gems model. But the synchrony is how each of us as humans are doing work in the context of often in organizations, but how we continually stay connected to each other, to the goals of the organization, to its strategic value it's trying to create, to the goals of a team, to the goals of each of us as individuals, and how we make sure all of those are aligned. And I believe that those, those skills, those areas of focus are critical for anybody who leads. I don't use the word leader very often. <laughs> I think leading is a verb, uh, but I think it's these are each the critical, and you have to decide which ones matter the most. But all four of them are critical if we're going to help groups of humans to be able to continually solve the problems of today and tomorrow. I love the idea of gems, and yes, these are uh, skills that forever, like they won't change. Kind of like when we think of soft right. and hard skills, it's uh, yeah. it's a perfect blend. I am an avid reader of your LinkedIn uh, newsletter. Gary, you talked a little bit about AI, and I have a question about a statement that caught my attention in one of your newsletters. Technology is not your equal. Our minds are being hacked. Uh, it's a scary sentence, and I would like to know how worried should we be about technology and how fast it's moving? So I've, I've first moved to the Silicon Valley in 1984, <laughs> uh, thinking that, you know, companies like Microsoft and IBM were already big and we're kind of done. I mean, what else could you possibly do with a computer? But all right, I'll, I'll, I'll move to Silicon Valley and see if I can do some work there. So I've seen cycles in Silicon Valley now for almost 40 years. And uh, I've been part of a lot of those cycles, <laughs> such as computer networking. And uh, there are wonderful things that our technologies enable us as humans to do. They allow us to solve a wide range of problems. They perform a lot of tasks, hopefully mundane tasks that we don't have to perform. But here's the challenge is that when we elevate technology, we almost inevitably diminish humans, right? So, so uh, when you were a farmer, 
you didn't partner with a plow. A plow was a tool. When you write, you don't partner with a pen. It's a tool. Software is a tool. And it, the, even though a lot of the current wave of artificial intelligence tools can kind of like what humans do, they sound incredibly similar to what a human might write, or I can do deep fake videos that seem kind of similar to what a human would say, it's still technology. And I know that this is a losing battle. I know that there are plenty of people that believe we're all gonna be cyborgs and have chips in the back of our brains and it's gonna blur the lines. I, I know it's a losing battle. What I am completely deeply committed to is a human centric future of work. And so I'm gonna keep on fighting this this uh, battle <laughs> as long as I can, where I, where I push to say, no, 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 the technologies are enabling us and humans, empowering humans to be able to find or create meaningful, well-paid work is really our goal. And then these tools are only useful if they help every human to be able to do that. I completely agree with you, but I see a lot of people posting and scaring us of this. The, the whole idea of, um, so many of the technologies sort of looking like humans is uh, the reason I said hacking our brains is that they're very, very smart uh, technology developers that are doing that very deliberately. That is making ChatGPT look like it's chat, like it's actually a conversation with a person when it isn't. It's basically just a bunch of software that's sifting through a whole bunch of information that humans created and kicking back something very quickly to you. My friend Vint Cerf, um, one of the co-founders of the Internet Protocols, he says these are these tools are glib. <laughs> that is, they they sound like a know-it-all teenager, uh, just kicking back really quick answers. The difficulty is that uh, when it comes to human work, if you if you buy my construct, work is very simply just three things. It's a problem to be solved. How do we solve problems? We perform tasks. How do we perform tasks? We have human skills. So human skills apply to tasks to solve problems. Uh, robots and software just automate tasks. That's really what they do. And even though the way that many of the new tools automate tasks looks kind of hu like human skills, they're not skills. They're not, they're not humans making decisions. They're just performing tasks. And so what ends up ha happening far too often is we think that it's okay to just throw software or, or um, hardware at automating tasks and then magically humans will go do the more interesting things. That would be wonderful if that's the way that it worked out. If, if robots were automating all these repetitive tasks down here and humans were doing all the creative stuff up here. What's historically happened is, no, 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 we fire all the people who are down here and then we hire new people to do this stuff. And so that's what we've done over and over again, especially in the US, but in many Western economies. And what I urge people to do is to, especially decision makers, especially people who lead organizations, is to deliberately invest in technologies that empower humans to do this work up here. And don't just continually discard humans and stop paying them for their work because we've thrown technology at some problems that humans used to perform. Such a wonderful idea and approach, and uh, you uh, really brought the positivity in it, despite of the sentence we started with. Uh, my last question to you, Gary, is we always, I always advise my young clients to get their, out of their comfort zone and embrace new opportunities. Your life so far has been embracing different opportunities for sure, but anything that you would like to share with the audience that you think it's cool for us to know about what you're going to do in the near future. Absolutely. So first off, for the young people, especially that you talk to, um, every time in history is challenging. This is an especially challenging time. Uh, I didn't, uh, when I was young, I didn't have to live through seismic events like 9-11, a global recession, <laughs> a global pandemic the advent of these new tools and so uh, and, and and the infusion of social media into our cultures. So I just want to acknowledge first off, these are challenging times and uh, and it's it's always challenging being a young person and then you know the, the, all of these tools that we're talking about are rapidly accelerating change. 
So, however, what that often does is it opens up a range of opportunity to those who have agency. And what, what is agency? But it's, it's taking a step. It's taking action in the hope that you're going to get a positive outcome. So that's the first thing I would want to encourage young people is uh, when you're young, you should be experimenting. When you're young, you should be trying out different things. Uh, whenever possible, it's wonderful if there is some type of North Star or Southern Cross that pulls you in the th decisions that you make around work. Um, now, some people call that purpose. Some people call that meaning. Uh, it, it, sometimes those are too big. Those words are a little bit too big. I think we can, any of us can find meaning in, in the work that we do. But it's really important to have a thesis about what you feel motivates you the most, whether it's the kind of skills you want to use the most, the kinds of problems you'd love to solve the most, the kinds of people you want to work around the most, uh, whether or not that's contributing to something that's good for human beings, that's good for the planet. It's important to have something that you feel is that North Star or Southern Cross that pulls you. And if you don't know what that is, it's great to go do a bunch of exercises to be able to try to help figure out what that, that, that you know, strong magnet can be for you. So then for me, what I find is most invigorating is I think we're at a unique time where so much of the way that we have approached our former institutions of work and of learning, which we often call schools and colleges and universities, those are all going through a really substantial, what I call a great reset. And so that creates a huge amount of opportunity. And what I believe is, is necessary right now and, and highly possible is to help bring a lot of people together to see how we can actually use this as an inflection point to create more human-centric work, human-centric learning. And I think we're back in years, 10 years, and we're going to say this was one of the most consequential pivot points in modern human history because we now have the, the shape of a lot of these changes. We have the tool set with these new AI tools that can give us superpowers as humans. We can solve problems we just never were able to solve before in the time that we can solve them. And, and so I, I believe that we're gonna see all these ripple effects in the way that we construct work within organizations, in the way that we construct learning within our institutions. And I think that is nothing but great opportunity. Now, now it is also disruption for those who've been doing it the old ways. But if we all have a growth mindset, if we all can be focusing on our effectiveness in our work, we can increase the membership, the connection between each of us in our work, and we can ensure that we're in synchrony, we're in connection between each other. I, I really do believe that that is an opportunity for each of us to be able to create a more human-centric future. Such a beautiful message and beautiful goals. And uh, I'm with you 100% for sure. These were all the questions I had prepared for you, Gary, today. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to talk about, but I didn't ask you, or uh, you've already wrapped up with beautiful advice, but is there anything else you'd like to add? I, I just would make the offer that I, that I always do for any of your, your listeners or viewers. Um, I, I, if there's any questions that you have, if there's any uh, a reference to resource materials or anything like that. I'm I'm very easy to find. So you mentioned my LinkedIn newsletter. I'm I'm G Bowles everywhere. G B O L L E S. I've got my website at gbowles.com. I'm G Bowles on LinkedIn. Uh, please, I would I would urge people to contact me. Um, and I've got I've got tons of links and resources um, on my website. Uh, for people to just be able to continue to explore it, especially for younger people to feel that they can develop that agency to be able to have some control and direction in their work. Well, I do echo your uh, availability. You were so easy for me to reach out and I felt very comfortable uh, wanting to talk to you after reading all your amazing newsletters. Definitely follow Gary Bolt's newsletters on LinkedIn. Thank you so much for your time, Gary. Oh no, wonderful conversation, Oda. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Hoda's Career Info, the program where career professionals from across the globe join me to empower you to succeed. Guest today on Hoda's Career Info is Gary Bowles. 
and he shared his story of not taking a straight career path and the amazing experiences he gathered along his journey of career exploration. You can connect with Gary Bowles on LinkedIn and Twitter. Don't forget to share your feedback in the comments section. Please remember that you can listen to Hoda's Career Info since it's also dropped as a podcast. To let me know if you are interested in an opportunity to talk about your work, you can send me a direct message on my website, writecareerfit.com, where you can also sign up for my newsletter to stay up to date on the latest episodes. Remember to like, subscribe, share, and follow me on social media for more career info. I am your host, Hoda, and until next time, stay inspired and keep moving forward in constructive ways. (laughs) 